what do I love about the McLaren F1? For me, a McLaren F1 is the greatest car ever built, which is widely regarded by many others as the same. This is a car that McLaren absolutely nailed right out of the box. It was their first road car and they sat down Ron Dennis, Mansour Auger, Gordon Murray, Creighton Brown and decided that if they were going to create a road car it had to basically upset the already established supercar hierarchy and what Gordon Murray done is he completely rewrote the supercar rule book which has never since been repeated not just on its you know at the fact of it was so much quicker than anything else at the time which you know everybody is interested in the speed and what's the 0 to 60 and 0 to 100 and 0 to 240 um, but the fact of that this car was so innovative you know everything was specially designed for the car right down to the Kenwood radio system and you know the special piece of luggage to the gold foil on the engine bay to be able to keep the heat down and that central driving position is something that obviously is since been repeated recently with the McLaren speed tail but that feeling that the driver gets um, there's no driver's car like a McLaren F1 and when you take time to consider on what it was competing against in period things of like a Ferrari F50 you know it's it's just a different league and McLaren F1 is the ultimate driver's car and for me the greatest car ever built. What makes 19R special? All McLaren F1s are very special cars. The long tail variants there were only 10 ever produced. Of those 10 cars the cars today reside in institutions places like mclaren the golf collection has one there's a couple of clients that have all of the variants that you know they have a short tail gtr a road gtr um, and a long tail gtr um, so to be able to have the opportunity to just buy a long tail mclaren f1 is a lot more special and unique than having the opportunity to purchase a road car um, this car was also, it was a, the factory prototype, it was the development car. It's not just a car that, on a lot of road McLaren F1s, you know, some of them have been to Sainsbury's, some of them have been to Waitrose, some of them have been to Walmart. You know, this is a car that actually done something. This is a car that Gordon Murray, this was the first car that, first long tail that he penned. This is the first car that, this is the car that created the other nine. This is the car that they tested. Um, so, you know, wind the clock forward. My business is very much about selling collectible cars and we sell pre-war cars, vintage cars. And, you know, if you wind the clock forward another 20, 30, 40 years, and you've just got one of the long tail cars that a privateer bought new, and owned and raced, or you've got one of the BMW cars, or you've got the actual factory prototype. There was only one prototype long tail, and that's this car. And for me, that's the car that McLaren probably should have retained in their ownership, but they actually, this car was sold on to, at the, what was at the time, one of their um, best and most successful privateer teams. Um, and today, this is only one of only two factory prototype cars that is in private hands. Um, the first uh, short tail GTR is still retained by the factory. That's chassis number 1R. That's the car that won Le Mans. And I don't see that coming out of their ownership. Um, the next factory prototype is the car that's owned by the renowned collector and musician Nick Mason who owns 10R, and then you've got this car, 19R, which is the only um, factory prototype long tail. It's also, for me, very special because of the livery. Um, colors make cars. You know, when I sell 60s Ferraris, and you can either sell them in retail red, or you get 
a very special Verde Pinot or a Blue Sarah. You know, colours make cars, they add so much more value to a car. And was it its original colour or did Jack and Bob at one time change the colour and suddenly make what should have been the car's original colour to make it look better? Where this actual car, 19R, the colours it's presented in today are the colours that the car was launched in back at the end of 96, November 96. And how it came around was that um, Gordon Murray wanted to show off, highlight to the press, the difference in the car, the extended bodywork. You know, the car is a lot longer than a 95 and 96 spec GTR. And in order to be able to do that, this is where the psychedelic accents came from because it, it accentuates uh, the bodywork. And that's how it came about. And the car was immediately known as Squiggles um, by all of the team at McLaren. And today it's still known as Squiggles. And I have to say there's certain colors that age particularly well. And then there's colors that don't age well. And I think the livery of this car has, you know, you, you wind the clock forward 23 years, it's aged fantastic. I have quite a lot of experience in selling McLaren F1s. Uh, in the last three years alone, we've sold seven different cars. And throughout the course of my career, I've probably sold more McLaren F1s than anyone else. Uh, there's been certain cars that special um, deals, moments, cars that stick in my mind, you know, which I've been very fortunate to be part of. There was obviously that delivery mileage yellow car, which I'm sure a lot of your members um, will remember, which I bought back in 2017. And that was a fantastic experience because nobody had known about the car, that it was still this new car that was still with the first owner. It was still in all of the factory wrappers, um, never been driven. And, you know, to get on a plane and fly to Tokyo and not to be able to speak the language of the owner and the owner not to be able to speak English, but to somehow sit down with um, an interpreter and to manage to get the deal done was a lot of fun. And I can tell you in that uh, 72 hours, because of the time zone difference, I think I slept something like three hours. Um, and then there was another, a few other deals that stick in my mind. There was Chassis 45, which I sold at the end of 2018, which was a fantastic car in a, a road car, uh, gray with gray interior. Um, but I sold it to a young gentleman in America, a friend, client, and he said, I'll buy it off of you, but on one basis, I've never driven a McLaren F1 before, and I want you to hand it over to me on a track, on a racetrack for the day. We took over Monticello for the day, which is a private track just outside of New York. And, uh, you know, it was a fantastic day. We took a helicopter from the center of New York straight to the track. Uh, he brought up some of his other cars, and the first time he, see, he had saw his new McLaren F1, was that morning, uh, came off the transporter and his first experience that he wanted to um, get to know the car was around Monticello, which was fantastic. And it's a fantastic place if you're ever in the area. Uh, and then there's so many other F F1s because of the, you know, because of the nature of the car and I suppose because of my affection to the car, me truly believing they're the greatest car ever built all of the deals stick, into, stick in my mind. And, you know, they've always been such a valuable car. And, you know, so they're all very special deals. It's, it's like 14R, which is a short tail GTR. And that car belonged to a very good client of mine that, you know, I'd been selling cars to since I was 14 or 15 years old. And I used to see the car all the time. And, um, you know, I then sold that car to Adrian Newey, which I'm sure everybody is uh, familiar with. And I remember actually delivering it to Adrian. And uh, in the car, there was a plaque. And uh, the plaque was signed by Ron Dennis. And 
obviously Adrian used to be part of McLaren um, and had left McLaren and went to uh, Red Bull. And when the car was delivered to him, it came off the transporter. He looked, he said, Tom, it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. You know, always wanted to own one. He said, but you know, we must just uh, maybe either cover that plaque up or remove that plaque. Um, so I remember that. And then Adrian, uh, he said, let's go for a test drive. And he, he's a good driver, Adrian is, but I'm still very nervous because even though he had paid for the car, you never quite feel that the deal is done and you've consummated the deal until you drive away, you've got your money in the bank and the client is happy. And he said, let's go for a drive. And, uh, you know, I was uh, in the left-hand side, well, on a short tail GTR, you've only got one passenger seat, which is on the left-hand side. And uh, he, he was driving it. And I remember thinking to myself, Adrian, just slow down a little bit. Like, has the, has the check definitely cleared? Because if you curb the wheels, am I taking it home with me? Um, so yeah, there's been some, there's been some great, I've got some great memories with all of the McLaren F1 deals. And, uh, you know, I remember all of them very intimately. How many miles have I covered in an F1? Well, um, I've driven a lot of miles in F1s. I've driven, you know, several F1s around racetracks, uh, short tail cars and long tail cars. Uh, it was a lot of fun driving uh, this particular long tail car around Donington uh, recently with yourselves, you know, that was a fantastic day. Donington's a great track and, uh, you know, to have it to ourselves was pretty special. The differences between all of the F1s, and I've done a lot of miles in F1s, you know, I've done a lot of miles in a road car, in a short tail GTR and a long tail GTR. So I've got a decent experience um, to be able to talk about one and, um, the road cars, you know, they're all very special in their own way. A road car is easily the most usable because it's the quietest, first of all, to travel in. You have the luxuries, you've got the, the leather and the Kenwood radio and the air conditioning, which the air conditioning in them, you know, it's 90s air conditioning. It's still not exactly climate control from a Mercedes Benz. Um, but, you know, it, it, they're a very special car to drive. And there is something that's particularly cool about having two passenger seats. Although I will say this about a McLaren F1. When you drive one, they are such a driver's car, the way it was designed, that without being unsociable, you don't actually think about the two passengers and you don't actually converse that much with the passengers because they're behind you and it's a little bit surreal where they're not they're not sat at the at the same obviously they're sat behind you so um it is very much driver orientated um but it would be very nice when my two boys get a bit older one day i suppose to do a road trip in a road car would be you know fantastic um a short tail gtr is basically it's a road car with you know a few changes it had a great big rear wing bolted on the rear um but to actually drive the car you know it doesn't drive that dissimilar to a road car um it, it, it's a little bit more um responsive you know it's probably it's a it's a better handling car but then you've also got the balance of saying, well, what about if I wanted to do a long journey? And, you, you know, so, so they have their pros and their cons. Um, a long tail GTR on the track, first of all, is way better. Feels so much more quicker, so much more downforce uh, with the car. Um, and it really surprised me actually driving it on the road because when I, the first long tail car that I ever purchased was 27R. And at that time, uh, Dean Lanzanti is a very good friend of mine. And I think his workshops are just fantastic. He's the place that you want to go to if you're ever servicing your McLaren F1. Um, and he said to me, he said, what do you think of it to drive? And I said, I haven't driven it yet. And he said, when you drive it, you'll be super impressed. And I said, round the track or on the, on the road? And he said, no, 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 on the road. The 27R was also road converted. He said, it's fantastic. And, and we were talking about 
a, a young gentleman that we both know who owns 28R, who uses his car often on the road. And I won't mention any names, but he said so-and-so uses his car all the time and he loves it. Um, and I still was a little bit skeptical because I thought, well, it's a race car. It's an out-and-out -out race car. Yes, you've managed to road convert it with Gordon Murray and the car is road registered, but how usable is it? And um, the sequential gearbox, you know, what about the ride height, turning circles, etc., etc. And I just couldn't believe it when I first drove 27R. Like, it's just, it's an easy car to drive. The sequential gearbox isn't difficult. Um, you know, it's actually super easy. It's super smooth. Uh, you have your headphones on because of noise restrictions with regards to the, the, the GT, GTR cars in general. Um, and that's also, there's something nice about that because you're not listening to you know, the Supremes or Temptations or whatever you might be listening to while you're driving. Uh, you, if you want to speak with the passenger, you've got your headphones on and you can speak and you're very focused on the road. You're very focused in your own driving and you've got to respect the car. If you look at Rowan Atkinson, you know, he's very well known for having a couple of uh, crashes in his car. One of them was um, super large and super expensive. Um, and you have to really respect the car and because of that anyway, you want to be focused on the job in hand. And, um, you know, all McLaren F1s are real driver's cars. This particular car, a long tail car, is very usable on the road. And that's something that initially surprised me. 19R was the first long tail that was ever road converted. Uh, it was a process that the owner at the time, who is another um, supercar driver member, uh, he, he, came, he sat down with Dean Lanzanti and he wanted to know if it was possible to be able to road convert his long tail and properly do so, not cheat and somehow find a way to be able to get it UK road registered, as some other people on some cars do from time to time, um, but to actually properly, legally road convert the car. And Lanzanti went with the idea, went with the car to Gordon Murray, who better, and said, Gordon, is this possible? And, uh, you know, Gordon Murray put his full team and the same team that worked on the F1 project when the cars were new, so all these guys knew the cars intimately well, um, and they set about road converting it with lots of different changes, ride height, uh, obviously the steering lock, um, you know, many different things, the, the, um, the fuel filler, uh, the exhaust, you know, it, it was a, quite a big project. And uh, Gordon documented the full conversion in a fantastic book that accompanies the car today and you know also talks about this particular car's life and history before the conversion and talks about throughout in a chronological order the f1 project of when it first started of when you know they first came up with the idea of when the first cars were delivered um which is, is really nice and this car will always be the car that was the first long tail to be road converted. What's it like to drive on the road? You know, it's not a difficult car to drive on the road. You know, long tail cars, I was originally skeptical on how, how well Gordon Murray and Lanzanti could have converted the car for road use, um, but I drove it with you guys for many, many, many hours the other day when we we done our filming, and um, Adam uh, accompanied me in, in the passenger seat for a lot of it, and you know the car, you're you're very driver focused, so you're very much the whole experience orientates around the driver, um, but the gearbox is very easy unit to use the sequential gearbox the clutch is as heavy as you'd expect it to be but not too heavy um, you have your headphones on to be able to speak with uh, with the passenger if you want to but to be perfectly honest and without being rude to Adam 
I was more interested in enjoying the, the hours I was spending um, driving the car than chatting about our current uh, pandemic. And, uh, you know, it's the suspension, I would imagine in full race mode, you will obviously feel if you ran over a coin, if it was on heads or tails. Um, but, you know, with the road conversion, the suspension is stiff enough where you can you can get the benefit of the car around a racetrack, but it's not too stiff that you can't drive it on the road and you're not, you know, shaking around like a bag of nails. Um, the car is a very, very, very usable car. F1s in particular, you know, just a normal road F1, that's what, for me, makes them so special because these are cars that you can actually use. You know, um, a guy in the UK has done... 44,000 miles or 46,000 miles in his F1 and he's owned the car from new. Um, it's a very well-known story that in period, uh, a German uh, businessman bought his car to be able to commute from Switzerland to Germany every day um, and, you know, commuting at very high speeds. So these are cars that Gordon Murray didn't design them to just sit on a pedestal. He did design the cars to be the ultimate driver's car, and that's what they are. And even down to the short tail GTRs and the long tail GTRs, these are cars that you should get out on the road, you should use, you should enjoy, because they're an experience that, I'm Ferrari through and through. You know, Ferrari for me is the best brand for my business. Um, it's always been very good to me i personally am very passionate about ferrari but there's no ferrari in the world that can compete with a mclaren f1 and mclaren f1 it's on a different level you know they have all these fantastic supercars and everybody's aspiration if you're into supercars should be a mclaren f1 you can have your f40 you can have your 288 gtos you can have your porsche gt1s and your 959s, and none of them, stick them all together, none of them come close to a McLaren F1. A McLaren F1 at the time was the most expensive car in the world at like 641,000 pounds. And when it was 641,000 pounds, today, you know, you hear about cars that they just bring anything out and it's two million and let's bring a car out without a roof and it's not usable and then we'll have a queue from here to the M25 and all around the M25 and back on people who want to buy them. You know, at this time when people were buying cars, they weren't buying them with a collector's mind at the forefront. They weren't buying them thinking to themselves that actually I'm going to buy this car as an appreciating asset where a lot of people today who buy new supercars, they buy them because they think I should buy that car, you know, and it'll go up in value. When McLaren produced the F1 they produced a car that was phenomenally expensive but it was expensive because of the R&D because of the development that went in to producing what was and what is the greatest of all cars and uh, you know it's something that until you've experienced it until you've driven an F1 until you've owned an F1 you'll never fully appreciate it. The starting procedure on a GTR is quite simple. Uh, you know, it can be a little bit intimidating if you've never owned a race car before and you're used to just putting a key in ignition and turning it or pressing a start-stop switch. Um, but it's very, very simple. You know, you literally have a master... You have your um, all of your electronics to your right-hand side and in the middle of the electronics you have your master on and off. You switch it to on, uh, which basically is turning all the battery, the electronics on in the car. You've then got a full fuel pump switch that you've got to switch the fuel pump on. Uh, you'll have, the car will give you some uh, feedback immediately on the, on the display unit on the dash. It will give you the oil temperature, the water temperature. It will ask you to reset the fuel but you don't really want to reset the fuel because the way it works is that you know how many liters the tank holds and it shows you how many liters you've used until you reset it. So what I normally do is just fill the tank to the brim 
and then you know when you're coming close that you need to put more fuel in. Um, or if you just put 30 litres in when you know that you've got to your 30 litres. And uh, so the, it will ask you to reset the fuel, you can cancel that off, it will ask you to acknowledge the alarm, and then you just press the, start, the starter button and it fires up and it's fantastic. And then you can just sit there and just rev it and just get all your joy and happiness from that. We've spoken about many of the car's attributes, uh, things like its original launch livery, the fact that it was the factory prototype and development car. Um, it, that it was the first long tail car to ever be road converted and it's UK road re registered. Um, but it is, it was born as a GTR long tail. They were born to go racing. And I think very, what is very important in the car's life is its race history. And this, this is a car that first raced at the Suzuka thousand kilometers in 97. Um, it raced 33 times uh, th throughout its life and it was the last McLaren F1 to ever obtain an overall victory at a major international race. Is it daunting to drive because of the values? You have to be very respectful when driving a car of this value. I don't get blasé. You know, I buy and sell a lot of cars that are very expensive, that on many occasions are much more expensive than this. Um, and cars which, you know, if they were to have an accident because of their originality, it would probably make a huge difference in the car's value because maybe if you had an accident in something like a a long tail GTR. I mean, it's a race car. So if you, if somebody clipped the, the wing or the rear end, you know, it, it's probably not as detrimental as what that would be as if it, if it was a road car, a road F1. Um, and also if it was maybe a sixties Ferrari or fifties Ferrari, it would be more detrimental again, detrimental again. Um, but you have to be very respectful. Uh, I can't say, I find it daunting because I'm used to driving cars of that value um, and I'm very respectful with it. The reactions that you get on the road is uh, phenomenal. It's funny, when I drive old cars, which I drive old cars often, you know, in the last 48 hours, I've been driving my pre-war Bentley four and a half liter a lot. And whenever you get, whenever you drive an old car, you have, you, you get a certain amount of respect from everybody. You know, everyone that you drive by looks and you can see them nodding and they put their thumbs up and, you know, um, it, it's a very nice feeling actually, I have to be honest. Uh, when you drive modern supercars, you get a different uh, type of reaction. You know, you get, can get some young, young kids that look and you can see them going like, oh, that's a Veyron, oh, that's a Enzo. And then, you know, you can maybe get um, an older generation of people that will look at you slightly differently. Um, and I'm not one to really worry too much about, you know, that, that type of look. Um, but Adam, who uh, was with me when we were driving the car the other day, he will comment that it's amazing the reaction that you get in this car. And I don't know if it's just because it's a McLaren F1 or I don't know if it's a lot to do with the livery. But uh, when, we, when we were out uh, driving the car, everyone that you was passing was kind of going like, wow, no. And, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it really is seeing people's reaction. Um, it's fantastic. And we were driving along the other day and Adam was saying, oh, have you, did you see the look that they gave? And did you see, you know, um, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite funny. And, and actually, I'm going to continue on more with that story where um, we were stopped by the police. And we were stopped by the police because the police um, claimed that he just wanted to double check that the car was insured 
um, and everything else. But I have to be honest, he was very, very interested in the car, looking at the car. And he said, this is a McLaren F1. I've never seen a McLaren F1 before. Like, where are you based? This is fantastic. Where are you going? What are you doing? And he was a super nice guy, actually, and a super cool guy. And um, at the same time, he did say he wanted uh, to, he wanted to check that the car was insured. He didn't spend that long checking that the car was insured, and I'm pleased to confirm it was insured. <laughs> the car is priced at $15 million. The car's priced in dollars as all cars of this value uh, are valued in, in dollars ultimately. Um, that's still quite a big saving off of the value of a F1 road car and the value of a short tail F1 GTR, um, which for me, and not just being a car salesman who's trying to, who's trying to sell a car, um, but for me that shows just incredible value and incredible future potential. You know, if, if we wound the clock back 15 years, 16 years, a short tail F1 GTR um, was lacking behind a, a normal road car. And everybody at that time, you know, it was, unless you were just a guy that had no knowledge at all on racing, which not many people who buy a McLaren F1 have zero knowledge on racing, um, everybody would would widely talk about the fact of why was a short tail GTR below the value of a road car? It doesn't make sense because a road car hasn't done anything, hasn't been anywhere, it hasn't made any history, where the short tail GTRs are the cars that really done something. They're the cars in 95 and 96 that changed the world of racing. Um, and for that reason alone, the car should be way more valuable. And today, you will see short tail GTRs, depending on the, sh the particular chassis history of trading anywhere from, for the you know, low 20s to low 30s, depending on that particular car chassis history. And then a road car, you know, we've sold several road cars for north of $20 million. Um, and, you know, the yellow delivery mileage car was well north of $20 million. Um, and then you look at a long tail GTR, and a long tail GTR was always so much behind a short tail GTR and a road car because of the lack of usability, where you couldn't, what could you do with one? It wasn't competitive to go and take one and race in any series 10 years ago, and you couldn't road convert one where you could road convert a short tail GTR. Now, since you've been able to road convert the long tail GTRs, Yes, the prices have moved up, um, but they're still, why are they still so far behind? Why is this car that's $15 million, you know, five, I, I mean, a, a European tax paid McLaren F1 today is north of $20 million for a car that's just done however many miles. Why is that the case when this car is a factory prototype it's the development car it's the last mclaren f1 to ever win any major international race why is it behind a road car like for me that doesn't make sense and i don't ever want to sell cars to people as investments because i'm not a financial advisor and i've always found in the past actually that if i um sell a car to a client and it goes up in value i've ne I'm yet to receive a check in the post where a guy says tom you're right the car's gone up in value so i'm going to give you some more money but if it goes down in value i'm sure i would get a phone call and say tom you know i, I can't believe i've actually lost money in this car and for that reason that reason alone i don't like selling people cars that come to me and say tom i want to invest some money in cars um 
So, uh, you know, the first thing I remind clients is that they should buy the car because they love it and they should buy the car because they want to own it. Because even if the car goes down in value, if you want to own the car and you bought the car for the right reason, you don't sell it and it will come back. You know, the values, like everything, the stock market goes up and it goes down and it comes back up again. And that the same thing happens with collectible cars. Um, so that's the person that, you know, I really ultimately like to sell cars to. And that's the person that I would like this car to go to. However, you know, if somebody did have an investment eye on it, just the corner of an eye on it, then I just, for me, it feels like it's a no-brainer. And, you know, I can't afford, I have a lot of my own personal cars and my business is unique where people that I compete against who, you know, buy and who trade cars, broker cars at the same level of cars that I do. I'm not talking about cars like, um, you know, a LaFerrari. I'm talking about very, very significant um, collectible cars. You know, we sell cars for tens of millions of pounds. Um, everybody I compete against, they broker cars where my business is quite unique, where I need my um, money because we, you know, we commit and we have skin in the game because we, we buy our cars. We believe in the car so much that we'll put our money on the table and say, I'm happy with that car. I'm not just selling it because I'm getting a 5% commission. I'm buying the car because it's a great car and I think we can make a profit. Um, and because of that reason, I can't afford to just buy cars and keep packing them away. But if I was going to be packing a car away, I would, and there's not many cars in the last couple of years I've said that about, I would be buying a long tail GTR and I'd be buying 19R and I'd be packing it away 